All right, let's get started. Um, I don't know if Marjena is here, so uh, anyway, I will try and manually monitor the, the YouTube thing today. Um, and today's topic is neural language models. So last time we talked about n-gram language models. Briefly at the end, we talked about smoothing um, to deal with like zero probability or zero count bigrams. Um, but now we're going to switch to uh, a better class of language models, and this is going to form the underpinnings of most of the rest of the semester. So uh, before we start, uh, your homework zero is due today. If you have just got added to the class um, and you're not on Gradescope, please send the instructor's account an email and we will add you. Um, and also to Piazza if you're not on that for whatever reason. Uh, the final group projects, your teams, if you want to um, have any say in who your team members are, uh, submit the Google form by Wednesday. We're going to try and get all the final uh, group assignments done by Thursday. So you'll have at least some time to work on your proposals with your team. Um, Someone in the anonymous form asked, can we have a lecture on the intersection of reinforcement learning and NLP? Uh, possibly. Uh, for all of you, you should feel free to suggest things that we can do at the end of the semester where there's currently lots of uh, open space. Um, but yeah, this is one of the potential topics we could consider. Although there hasn't been too much success in this intersection yet, so it might just be a overview of failed efforts in the past, but it could still be interesting. All right, anyone else have any logistics questions or anything like that? Yes? Sorry, what is the question? Are there weights for? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do quizzes count for grading? Um, yes, they form your participation grade. So at the end of the semester, we'll tabulate all your quiz scores, and then the average of that will be, um, or whatever, the total quiz score will be your participation score. So it'll be 10% 10, 10 uh, of your final grade. Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question, uh, I'm just going to keep repeating the questions back because the YouTube people can actually hear your, your questions. Um, sorry, what is the question? <laughs> uh, uh, well, yes. <laughs> right, right, right. What format is the quiz in? It's uh, going to be a Google Doc. You'll just write your answer as like a short paragraph. There, there's one or two questions per week. This week there will be a quiz. It'll go out either tomorrow or Wednesday and be due on Friday. So you have a lot of time to do it. It shouldn't take that much time. Um, it's a, a part of your participation grade. So um, we're not grading for correctness. Uh, but that said, if you write something completely irrelevant, the, the graders will know. So uh, at least try and do a good job. All right, any other questions? Let me see on the YouTube. All right, no questions. Um, great, I have to do this again. Maybe I'll just do this and see how this goes. Is this irritating to anyone? Okay, so um, if you recall from last time, we introduced this task of language modeling, right? And our goal was to compute the probability of a sequence of words. We talked about how that's actually the same task as predicting the next word given all the previous words that we've seen because we can use these conditional probabilities to get the joint probability through the chain rule of probability. So we talked about all of these things and a language model that's computing either this joint probability or this uh, conditional probability of the next word given all the previous words we refer to as a language model. So when we're talking about neural language models, we're generally going to be directly modeling these conditional probabilities. Um, and so that's what we'll be spending our time um, today and for the foreseeable future talking about. 
Um, and we talked about n-gram models, right? And so the way that we get these n-gram models is simply by counting and normalizing. So if I wanted to know how frequent or what is the probability of students open their books, right? Um, I would look for the probability of books given the prefix students open there. I would estimate this using the maximum likelihood estimate. I would take some data set. I would just count how many times students open their books occurs, count how many times students open their occurs, and I would have my uh, conditional probability. We saw those, um, you know, the tables that you have to store these counts in to get a good n-gram model. Um, all of that was from last time. So there are several issues with n-gram models. Um, we talked about a couple of issues, right? What happens if books never occurs in our training data, right? So then the probability of students open their books is zero, but this is obviously undesirable because students open their books is a perfectly fine um, phrase to have or even sentence. Um, and so briefly at the end, we talked about the high level approach of smoothing these n-gram models to account for these zero probability n-grams that we don't observe in our training data. So, um, I mean, this partial solution here is just one way of doing smoothing. There are many different, more and more complicated ways that take account take into account, for example, the part of speech of a particular word or the syntactic uh, construction of the prefix and things like that. Okay, another problem that we touched on last time was a storage, right? The n-gram models, we saw the table for a bigram model, right? It's the size of the vocabulary, let's say that's v, it's a v by v table, but as you increase n, right, the, the length of the prefix, your table storage requirements are going to go up exponentially in um, that n, right? So v to the n. Uh, and this just makes it impractical to store, let's say I wanted a 20 gram model, right? Um, this table is going to be huge if my vocabulary even is like medium sized. I won't be able to, uh, also the sparsity issues with a 20 gram language model are, are crazy. So um, no one does this. Um, so this is another issue. Um, and then there's a more fundamental issue, like setting all of that other stuff aside. Because you, know, you could take an incredibly huge data set and you could estimate maybe you know, like a 10 gram model or an 11 gram model. And maybe your sparsity issues with, with some uh, clever smoothing aren't actually all that bad. Uh, so people used to do this, and uh, I assume some uh, industry um, companies still use these kinds of huge scale n-gram models as part of their, their uh, products. But uh, the fundamental issue is that there is no sharing between prefixes or words that have similar meanings in this kind of count-based setup, right? So students open their, the, this prefix, very similar to scholars open there, or undergrads open there, or students turn the pages of there, right? This one even has a different length, but semantically it's, it's quite similar in, in meaning, right? Students attentively peruse there. This is like the opposite of what you, you all do for your readings. Um, but you, know, you would want to share information uh, across all of these prefixes, right? So if I saw students attentively peruse their blank, um, it would be good to, for example, update the counts for all of these related um, prefixes. And that's not happening in, um, in n-gram models. OK, um, and so why is this not happening? I mean, we already saw in the, the tables, right, where we have a separate row, essentially, for every single one of these prefixes. Um, at stepping back, uh, n-gram models rely on what we call the bag of words assumption. So every word within an n-gram model or um, any of the, this broader class of models re represents each word in the vocabulary as a one-hot vector. So some of you may, might be familiar with this concept where, let's say I had the word movie and the word film. These are clearly synonymous words. We would like to share information from the occurrences of both of these words. But in an n-gram model, these two words are completely orthogonal, right? They're represented with two different one-hot vectors. There's 
no similarity at all between, between these two vectors. Uh, it's not like movie and film are any closer to each other in this kind of representational space than movie and I or movie and hate or something like that. Okay, so I just went over all these issues. Um, but basically, all words in this kind of representation are equally similar, equally dissimilar, right? They're, they have, if you're using the inner product to compare the, or to measure the similarity, they're all zero. So we, we learn nothing about the relationship between words or prefixes when representing them in this way. So uh, one of the insights of these uh, more complex class of models we'll be discussing today is that we might want a representation space where something like the inner product between the representations of words and prefixes is actually meaningful um, and it kind of correlates with semantic similarity or, or syntactic similarity, some kind of linguistic similarity. Right? We, want, we want a vector space where maybe the inner product between movie and film is actually quite high the inner product between movie and shirt might be quite low. So um, broadly, uh, a neural network gets around this bag of words assumption by encoding the prefixes and the words into low dimensional real valued vectors. So instead of a one hot vector, we now get a bunch of different real numbers. And uh, hopefully, we the um, you know, some similarity metric over these vectors is going to correlate with things that we, we expect it to. So um, with, with our example, right, students open there, we would pass this through a neural network, which is just some function of, of vectors, and we would train this model. Um, we would put a classifier on top of the vector representation of our prefix, students open there, to predict the next word books. So this is not a count and normalize type model. This is a machine learning model that requires you to train this using things like gradient descent and backpropagation, which we'll talk about on uh, Wednesday. So in this lecture, we will just talk about the forward pass of uh, one of these neural language models. That means how do we go from the actual words of our prefix to a prediction of what the next word is going to be. We're not going to talk about how we actually train this network to do a better job of predicting like books over shirt or something. Um, that, that's what we'll do uh, on Wednesday. That, that's called the backward pass. All right, so we've talked about one hot vectors as a potential way to represent words, and this is what you know n-gram models are doing. Um, in neural language models, we don't represent um, words or uh, prefixes as one hot vectors, but rather as, uh, like I said, these low dimensional real valued vectors. So for example, we might represent this word king as this four dimensional vector of uh, real numbers. Um, so you can see here that if we have an entire vocabulary, we represent every single word as one of these kinds of vectors. Uh, and hopefully we have some reasonable training objective to make words that mean similar things closer to each other, then um, we can actually observe some interesting relationships emerge in this vector space. So some of you might have heard of word devec. Uh, we're not going to cover this in this class, but um, it was kind of the first approach to popularize this way of uh, encoding words. And uh, later on, it became an approach to encode I mean, it evolved into an approach to encode not only words, but phrases and sentences. And now we, we're encoding everything uh, with these dense real valued um, vectors. But in the, in the original word devec release, we could see all these interesting analogies in the vector space, like a walking to walked. Um, they're the same distance and direction away from each other as swimming and swam. So you can see this kind of past tense uh, verb relationship here. Countries and capitals had the same um, sort of relationship. Uh, so lots of interesting things came out of this that you can't get out of a, a one hot representation. So we this, this slide here is talking strictly about words. Um, but of course, in a neural language model, we're not just concerned with words, right? We want to predict the next word 
But we want to do that conditioned on an entire prefix, which is usually multiple words, right? It could be you know, an entire part, part of a document or something like that. Uh, it could be paragraphs long. So the process that we use to, uh, let's say that we encode every single word in our prefix, a student's open there with one of these dense vectors. So I have a separate vector for students. I have a separate vector for open, a separate vector for there. And what I want is to compose all three of these embeddings or vectors together into a single vector that represents the meaning of this phrase students open there or this prefix rather. And this is where a neural network comes in. So in this class, we're going to talk about a lot of different composition functions which are implemented as neural networks that take a sequence of word embeddings, not only word embeddings, they could be subword embeddings or character embeddings, some representation of the input that's been vectorized in this way, and it outputs either a single vector or multiple vectors that describe the meaning of this, uh, this phrase. Um, so once we have this uh, neural network and it's been trained, all right, and these vectors are actually kind of meaningful, we can then use it to predict the next word by placing a classifier on top of it. Um, and so this is very different than how we, we saw that we would predict the next word from an n-gram model, right? An n-gram model just directly gives us this probability distribution when we count and normalize by the, um, the prefix count, right? Here it's, it's quite different, as, as we'll see. So in this class, we will start um, and actually start at the end. So we'll assume that we've already gone through this process of composition, and we have a vector that describes the prefix. Um, and from this prefix vector, we're going to first look at the process of how do we compute the probability distribution over our entire vocabulary of what word comes next. Ideally, if we were, um, if students opened their books as the target thing that we want to predict, the probability of books would be quite high after this process, and the probability of something like desk would be low, although I guess desk could be plausible. But, um, and so the way that we do this is using something called a softmax layer. Um, some of you who have taken the neural networks class or who have played around with neural networks are probably very familiar with what this does and how it works, but we'll cover it here um, for, for everyone else. Um, you can view it intuitively as a way of taking one of these dense vectors and converting it into a probability over your desired output classes. And in this particular problem, we have as our output classes the entire vocabulary in our training data set, right? So every possible word is a potential label and we want a distribution over all of these word, word types. Remember the distinction between types and tokens. All of the unique word types in our vocabulary, we want this distribution and we want the probability of books to be high, essentially. So, uh, more visually, uh, if we're taking this, this three-dimensional vector here, which represents students open there, we want to feed it into a softmax layer, which will give us the probability distribution over the whole word, uh, whole vocabulary, where maybe p of books and p of laptops is high, and p of zoo is is low. All right, any questions to this point? Any YouTube questions? Why did I do that? Okay. Um, and this probability distribution is exactly the conditional probability distribution that we've been interested in this whole time, right? Um, I can, if I wanted to recover the joint probability distribution, just have, take the product of all of these conditional probability distributions for a particular text. Okay, so let's go through a uh, simplified toy example just so you can see all of the um, stuff that's happening here. So in particular, let's say that I have only four words in my uh, output vocabulary. This, of course, would never happen in, in real life, but um, the four words are books, houses, lamps, and stamps. So books is the only plausible, um, I think, yeah. 
and uh, our desired output after passing this three-dimensional vector into this Hopmax layer is to get a probability distribution over this four-word vocabulary. So we have a probability of books given, students open their houses, lamps, and stamps. So we want something like this. And how do we do this? Uh, it's actually just a simple matrix vector uh, product. So we have our three-dimensional vector. We first want to project this into a four-dimensional space because we have four words in our vocabulary. How do we do this? We simply take a four by three matrix and we multiply it by our um, prefix vector, which we've already decided is three dimensions. Again, this is just a toy example. Um, so in your homework, you also have some instances of these, these kinds of matrix vector um, products. And um, when we get to subsequent homeworks where you're actually using libraries that hide all of this for you, you can know that this is actually what's, what's happening under the hood. OK, so let's go through this. The first step, again, is to uh, just do this matrix vector product. And it's, it's nice to kind of have some intuition of what's happening when, when, you, when you do this. So you can view, if, you're, if you've taken a machine learning class, you've probably learned things like logistic regression and having features and then having weights on those features. You can view the, uh, each dimension of this prefix embedding that we've computed as corresponding to some feature about the prefix. The difference here is that we don't actually know what each dimension here means. It might not mean anything um, in, you know, corresponding to a semantic or syntactic property. Um, or it might be that groups of these uh, dimensions together correlate to some properties. We don't know. But intuitively, you can kind of think of it as each dimension is a feature. Um, it's just unknown what that feature corresponds to. And then each row of this matrix, which we're calling W here, corresponds to feature weights for a particular word in the vocabulary. So the first row here is uh, corresponding to the feature weights of books, second row to houses, third row to lamps, and fourth row to stamps. So you can see that the lamps uh, row seems to give high importance to this first dimension and low importance to the second dimension. Um, stuff like this. So what happens when we take the matrix vector product? Um, like, like I said, these don't correspond. I mean, they may not correspond to linguistic properties. So when we take the matrix vector product, we get this four-dimensional vector, right? So look at, looking at this, this is not a probability distribution, right? These are just four random numbers. But it's, we, we should still look at how we got each value in this. Uh, so just like a basic linear algebra review. To get the first number here, 1.8, I take the first row of this, uh, this matrix. And I, whoops, I simply just take the dot product of this first row with this uh, uh, prefix vector that I have. Um, so I take the feature weight 1.2, I multiply it by the feature value of this prefix thing, negative 2.3, so on and so forth. And when you do the math, you get 1.8. Um, and so this right here, 1.8, corresponds to the unnormalized score of books, which is the first entry in our vocabulary. Uh, books, houses, lamps, stamps. So 1.8 is um, referring to books negative 11.9 to houses, and so on. So hopefully that gives you some intuitive idea of what's, what's happening here. All right, so now we have this four-dimensional vector, but this is not a probability distribution. So we, we call these things logits in the, um, the uh, terminology of, of any of these neural network models. Um, and that means they're unnormalized. So the final step of this process is to squash this thing into a probability distribution. So what are the desirable traits? or what, what, are that de what is the definition of a probability distribution, right? This is clearly violating multiple um, parts of that. Yeah, so this definitely doesn't, I mean, it, yeah, it doesn't sum to one. 
Um, that's for sure. What what else? Right, non-negative, right? We can't have negative probabilities. Um, so that's that's another thing. So it should sum to one. It should be non-negative. Anything else? Uh, I mean, that that covers everything, right? Um, so let's say these are the the things we want to apply to this vector to convert it into something that we can treat as a probability distribution. Uh, and this is where the softmax function comes in. This is uh, why this thing is called a softmax layer. We basically exponentiate every single term in this four-dimensional vector, and then we normalize by the sum of the exponentiated terms. So the exponentiation, that makes all the values positive. And then dividing by the sum makes everything sum to one. There are, of course, other reasons why we might want to use this function over, say, any other type of normalization. For one, the softmax function when paired with the cross entropy loss, uh, we'll talk about these things um, uh, in the next class, it makes the gradient really nice. Um, so uh, we, we may talk about that next class, I, I don't remember. Um, but for now, you can just think of it as a squashing function to get uh, something that we could treat as a probability distribution out. So I, I think I messed with the numbers a little bit here just to make the uh, output distribution more reasonable because um, they were like quite large before. But if you change the numbers to something more reasonable, you might get out a probability distribution like this where the probability of books is 24%. The probability of... Uh, what was this one? Lamps is actually 73%, so this model isn't doing a good job at all. Um, but through training, we can train, adjust the weights of this W matrix such that the probability of books will increase the next time we see this example. Uh, the interesting thing, if, if you're familiar with you know, traditional feature-based logistic regression, the interesting thing is that here, the features, the x's, those also change during this training process because the x's come from a composition function, a neural network, which is what we're going to um, talk about next. So there's a question, is the softmax layer another name for multi-class logistic regression? Yeah, they're doing the same thing. So like a sigmoid layer is what you would use for binary classification. Softmax you use for multi-class classification. And language modeling here, we are treating as a multi-class classification problem, right? And what are the classes, just to make sure people in? The vocabulary, right? All the word types in the vocabulary. OK. Um, so is this, yes. To sum up, assuming we have a representation of our prefix, and here we saw this three-dimensional vector as our prefix representation, um, what we do is first project this into a vector that's of the size of the vocabulary, right? So in our case, vocabulary was four words, and so our projected vector was also four words. And after we do this, and so we accomplish this with a um, matrix vector product in um, the uh, naming conventions of popular deep learning libraries like PyTorch, this is usually called a linear layer or a feedforward layer or something like that. Um, and after you do this, you then apply a softmax function, which we just talked about, to get a probability distribution. So we'll talk about stuff like the loss functions and all of that um, uh, on Wednesday. All right, any questions about this part? So like x is not a parameter in the model. Like I don't have a fixed vector for every single um, prefix that I see in my training data. Otherwise, this thing would become like an n-gram model, right, where I just have a vector for every single um, uh, prefix vector. So this x is actually the output of another neural network, essentially which has its own parameters. So those parameters are trained along with this W matrix. Uh, so maybe that'll be more clear after we go through the next section. Any other questions? Yes? Is W something that has a, a, a weight for each of the types of words in the vocabulary? 
Yeah, so, okay, I forgot to repeat your question. I will <laughs> remember this one. Is, does W have a weight, meaning like a row, I assume, for every word type in the vocabulary? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, so this means that if, for example, I have a vocabulary of one million word types, this matrix is gonna have one million rows. Um, we will talk, uh, I'm not sure when, but at some point about ways because that, that, that uh, matrix vector product becomes quite expensive when you have like millions of rows. And so there are techniques that people use to cut down on the computation um, with some clever tricks. But uh, it's not clear if they actually will matter in the future as we get bigger and bigger GPUs and TPUs and stuff. But uh, yeah, it has mattered in the past. Other questions? Okay, let's uh, move on then. To the composition function. So, um, and this is getting more to your question about what exactly goes into the process of predicting this three-dimensional vector and what does it mean to train the uh, composition function. So now that we know how to predict books, we'll move on to how do we get this vector of students open there. So when I say composition function, I'm referring to a function that takes an input, a sequence of these word embeddings or token embeddings, or it, whatever type of tokenization we're using. Um, in this lecture, I'll just say word embeddings, but it could be characters or it could be subwords or, or something. Um, so it takes as input the sequence of the prefix tokens and outputs a single vector. So the simplest possible way to do this is to use an element-wise um, function. So for example, I could just sum up all of the word embeddings in the sequence, and then I could get my vector and pass it into the softmax layer. Uh, why would I not want to do this? Yeah, exactly. So students open there. That's going to have the same representation if I do, say, addition of the vectors as open their students or their open students, right? Um, so the model is not going to learn um, things about word order, which might be necessary to predict the next word. Um, maybe it's not a huge problem if the prefixes are short, but imagine if the prefix is like a thousand words and uh, I'm essentially not giving it the word order of what the, um, the prefix is. That's, that's a huge loss of information. So one that we'll look at today is concatenation, um, where we just concatenate all of the word embeddings in the sequence together, and then we might apply uh, our projection layer to this or a feedforward layer on top before our uh, softmax layer. Um, there are also things like convolutional neural networks, um, recurrent neural networks, which have historically been much more popular for language type data, and then uh, transformers, which are the dominant architecture that, that is used today um, to uh, compose um, a sequence of embeddings. And specifically, transformers use something called self-attention to accomplish this uh, composition. So we will talk about attention and self-attention next week, and um, then probably talk about transformers both next week and the following week. Um, they're a fairly complicated type of model, so it takes, takes some time. OK, but we'll start with concatenation, since the, the element-wise functions are, are obviously not suitable for this, this problem. So the reading that you had for today was a research paper. It wasn't a textbook. It was actually the first neural language model that was ever proposed, uh, this uh, Bengio et al. 2003 paper. Uh, it came out in 2003. It actually not only introduced this concept of neural language models, it also introduced the concept of learnable word embeddings. Um, so you know, years before something like word devec came out, um, and the, the process of training these word embeddings through the objective function of predicting the next word, which is something that all of NLP relies on today. So it's actually a very foundational paper. Uh, that said, the model proposed in that paper had many limitations. So if we had uh, 
longer prefix, like as the proctor started the clock, the students opened their blank. Um, in one of these fixed window concatenation-based neural language models, we're going to just toss away parts of the prefix that are outside the, the size of the window that we select. So this is a limitation that is common to this model as well as n-gram models, right? We saw that in a um, unigram or bigram language model, we're using this Markov assumption to just toss out a lot of the, the prefix and focus on the most local words. This model is making the exact same assumption. So here, we're focusing on this window, students open there, um, trying to predict the next word. Uh, how exactly do we implement this composition function? So let's say that we have our word embeddings for each of the four words in this prefix, so the students open there. I'm going to first concatenate all of these vectors together. So if you assume that these vectors are each four dimensional, the con concatenated vector is now 16 dimensional. So I just like glue these things together. Uh, now I have a 16 dimensional vector. Now um, in the model, I add what's known as a hidden layer. So this is a linear layer, just a, a projection into a different um, vector space, but it also has a nonlinearity um, along with it, so this f function. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but you can see that the dimensionality has now changed, right? This was a formerly 16-dimensional vector. Now it's been projected into like a 12-dimensional space. Now we take this 12-dimensional vector and pass it through a softmax layer. Um, so this f function, before I get to that, the f function is an element-wise nonlinearity. Um, we need to add things like these if we want our model to be capable of handling nonlinear relationships between the input data and the um, output, which certainly are, is happening in, in this case. So some common nonlinearities that are used today are uh, the ReLU function, a rectified linear unit, which is uh, very straightforward. It just changes all negative values in the vector to zeros. There are other variants of this that people use today. Um, in recurrent neural networks, it's common to see people using 10H or sigmoid, um, stuff like that. But um, we'll talk more about the specifics when we get to the transformer architecture, which, which is the one that is our focus this semester. Anyway, we have this 12-dimensional vector now, and we pass it into our softmax layer, which we've already seen is going to give us a distribution over the vocabulary, where hopefully books and laptops have high probability. So this w sub 2 is now a different parameter of our model, a different weight matrix than w sub 1, which we've used to accomplish this 16-dimension to 12-dimension transformation. Um, so you could have, for instance, just put the softmax layer over the 16-dimensional concatenated vector. Um, the reason why you might want to do this is you might want to introduce some sort of bottleneck representation into your network where uh, the 16-dimensional vector is forced to be represented in a lower dimensional space. So hopefully important semantic information is encoded in this intermediate layer. Another reason is if you don't have this, all of the parameters of your model are in the word embeddings, the C's here, as well as this W sub 2 parameter. So nowadays it's very common to have deep neural networks where you have multiple layers of these transformations between the uh, embeddings and the final softmax layer. And a lot of the parameters of these models are in these intermediate weight matrices, um, these fully connected feedforward layers. So we'll see this in the case of the transformer where it's common to train you know, 24 or 48 layer transformers where you have you know, so many of these layers of uh, nonlinear transformations. Um, it's a good way of getting more parameters into your model, which um, as we'll see later on, bigger models have very different properties than smaller models and they tend to be much more useful for NLP tasks. Okay, but this, this was the 2003 model. There was a single hidden layer. This F function was a 10H, I think, and the model was trained on a very small data set to accomplish this task of next word prediction. 
So let's look at some comparisons. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, in this model, how do you decide how many words to include in the fixed window? So here we've just decided four. Uh, this is what's called a hyperparameter of the model. So it's something that you as a designer of the model select beforehand. Maybe you think four is the best compromise between what you can feasibly train on your machine, but also gives you the best uh, language modeling performance or something like that. It's also something that you can tune on your validation set. So this is commonly what's the, the purpose of a validation set is to tune hyperparameters to find the best model where your definition of best is, is whatever um, you want it to be. So the, so the question is, uh, I, I think there might be some confusion with how the fixed window is either changing or not changing as the input data changes. Um, the fixed window is decided once before any sort of um, data is passed through this model. So if I decide that I will have four words in this, uh, this model in the fixed window, Every single input I see will be truncated to four words and then passed into this, uh, this approach. Yeah, so it's not the smartest way. And the models that we'll look at um, later on have much better um, profiles as to how much uh, prefix input they can handle. All right. Um, so let's compare this thing to a normal n-gram model. First, we don't have a sparsity problem anymore. So w why? Uh, OK, I guess it just <laughs> explained it here. Um, I should have blanked out some of these things. Um, but we're not storing the entire n-gram count table anymore, right? So I don't have in this model a specific count of the students open their books, the students open their laptops. I don't have this, right? I'm asking the model to predict this. And the training data is going to guide me to making better predictions of books if books is observed in my training data. But nowhere is the count of the students open their books explicitly a part of the model parameters. So what exactly are the parameters of this model? What, what would I be learning if uh, I were to train this model? Yeah, so I have these uh, word embeddings, right? And so I might have, you know, of size V, the number of vocabulary types I have. Notice that in uh, n-gram models, I would have a separate entry for every possible prefix that I observe in my training data. Here, I only have an embedding for every word type, individual word type, not prefix. Um, so I have those. Those are going to account for the majority of my uh, parameters in this model, um, not in the models we'll see in the future. Then I have these two weight matrices, right? This W sub 1 and W sub 2. We've already seen these are pretty small in, in this toy example. And so the number of parameters in this model is far fewer than what I would have in a you know, big n-gram model. So that's good. We may not have to deal with as many sparsity issues as we would in an n-gram model. Something like uh, smoothing is not explicitly required in this case, although we might want to add some regularization to our neural network, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, but there are issues with this model, right? The number one issue is it still has this fixed window, which we know is a big limitation because there is important information that is outside of this four-word window that we want the model to um, be sensitive to. So having a fixed window is a big limitation. That's one thing. Um, another thing is that the number of parameters in this uh, first weight matrix here, it grows with the size of the window, right? If I were to add another word to my fixed window, this thing would now become like a 20 by 12 matrix instead of a 16 by 12. So this limits me if I want to have a really big fixed window. 
Um, but that's that's not even the main issue with the, with the fixed window. It's that the weights that correspond to different positions of the window are not shared in this model. So if you think about this weight matrix W sub 1, right, it's a 16 by uh, 12 weight, ma weight matrix, right? And if you think of it as blocks of like 4 by 12, um, uh, like little sub matrices, each of these blocks is working on a, uh, a separate position of the sequence, right? So the first four rows might correspond to the, uh, the word farthest away from the current word. Then the second four rows might correspond to the word that's uh, second most far, and so on. Um, but the, the network has to learn essentially how to deal with uh, a word that's four words away independently of how to deal with a word that's three words away, how to deal with a word that's two words away. These parameters are all separate from each other. Whereas we might want the network to be more economical in how it's using its parameters. And maybe we wanted to learn how to um, you know, treat all of these words uh, equally with using shared parameters instead of um, different weights for every single position in the window. So that specific problem is what uh, this problem, in addition to the fixed window issue, is what the recurrent neural network is built to handle. So we're going to switch over to that. Um, and so this is a, a slightly more complicated class of models in which the computation proceeds sequentially instead of all at once. So in a fixed window language model, I could do all the computation at once. I would just take the students open there, do this concatenation, pass it through a feed forward layer, pass it through a softmax layer, and I'm done. It's a little more complicated in a, in a recurrent neural network. Um, these kind of follow the, the human reading process of going from left to right. You're updating your representation of what you've read after seeing a new word. Um, so uh, time-wise, it's going to be uh, slower than uh, the, the simple model I showed you before. Although these things do depend on your implementation as well. But just like before, we're going to start with the word embeddings. They're now shown here as uh, columns, so we're not concatenating them anymore. So the students open there. Um, in a recurrent neural network, we always start with an initial hidden state. So this thing, let's just say, is a random vector for now. The hidden state is going to be our representation of everything that we've seen up till this word um, and including this word. So before we start processing the sequence, we haven't seen any words before. So we start with some random vector. Um, now, the next thing we do is we go one word in the future. So we see the word the. And our goal is to update this hidden representation, which was previously random. But now have it include this word that we've just seen, the word the. So how do we do this? Uh, if you look at this equation here, this is the definition of a recurrent neural network. There are two different weight matrices that are doing this linear projection that we talked about. So let's say that I have this C. This is my word embedding. C sub 1 is the word embedding for the. If you look at the equation, I'm multiplying it by this matrix W sub E. So this is accomplishing some sort of projection. Usually this vector, um, the well, I, I won't say usually, but commonly in implementations, the dimensionality of the embeddings and the hidden state uh, is the same in these kinds of networks. So this W sub E might be a four by four matrix. So it's just doing a transformation um, of the embeddings into a different space. So we have, and that corresponds to this uh, arrow here. The other thing that we do in a recurrent neural network is take the previous hidden state, so this random vector that we started out with because we hadn't seen any words before, um, and we project it into another representation, um, this h sub t minus 1. It gets multiplied by this matrix w sub h. And we add the two projections together and apply a nonlinearity. So this is commonly the tan h. Um, and after this process, we have the new hidden state for h sub 1. So this thing is no longer random, right? 
we've now injected it with some information about the uh, word the, the first word in the sequence. And now we're ready to do another time step. So we apply the exact same equation. This is a recurrent um, update because this hidden state is proceeding step by step. It's getting updated um, through this process as a function of the previous hidden state. So in the second time step, we take the word embedding for students. We apply the same projection, W sub E. So this is a difference from the concatenation version, right? Because the same exact matrix is being used to process the and students. Whereas in the concatenation-based approach, we had different parts of that giant matrix working on both of these words. So parameters were not shared across the time steps, but they are in this case. So we have this W sub E, we have another projection, and then we take the previous hidden state. So this thing only had information about the word the. And now, through this update, and when we get H sub 2 here, we've now given it information about the students. Um, so theoretically, this thing does not have a fixed window, right? I could apply this to infinite words. And if the hidden state is you know, adequately encoding information about everything that it's seen, then maybe this is a great representation of the prefix. Of course, in practice, that's not how this goes. These things do have a practical limit on how far back they can remember information. There have been many variants of the recurrent neural network that have been proposed to enable them to reach across longer dependencies, longer contexts. So you might have heard of uh, things like LSTMs or GRUs. All of these models are superior versions of the simple uh, recurrent neural network, but they all essentially follow the same principle of I have one word coming in at a time, I'm making an update to my hidden state, and then moving on to the next word. Uh, so we won't be covering those fancier models in this class because uh, transformers are, are complex enough, but uh, if you're interested, you could, you could read up on them. Yeah? So what's the advantage of having the same W matrix work on every single word in the sequence? Well, it's like if you go back to this, this model, right? Is, is, it, is there a reason why the word students should be processed by a different set of parameters when it appears in position two of the prefix versus position three of the prefix? This, this assumption kind of breaks down when you have longer windows, right? Should a word at position 19 really have different parameters than a word at position 30? Um, intuitively, it's hard to see why, especially if the language is being pr processed sequentially, then it makes a lot more sense why you can be more economical with your parameters and just process every word the same. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's one reason. It's kind of hard to see in this tiny uh, example, but yeah. yeah. Uh, when you say H0 is random, is it like actually a random random? No, like that's a good question. So I, I just said that to make it easier <laughs> to understand, but the H0 is traditionally a learned parameter of this model. So I, I mean, when we talk about backpropagation, this will make more sense. But uh, you can think of H0 as just some learned vector that's part of the model. And uh, the intuition is maybe there's some initial state that is common to you know, all possible texts that makes this model easier to optimize than others, uh, or something like that. Um, so I, I guess there are multiple approaches. There's a, an approach is just to initialize this thing to all zeros initialize it with some random vector and keep it fixed, or initialize it with a random vector and then train it as a parameter of the, uh, the model. Yeah? If C1, C2, C3, so like you go and one-hot encoded, uh, So the question is, are these one-hot vectors? No, these are not one-hot vectors. These are the dense uh, word embeddings that we've been talking about um, from, from before. So these are also parameters of our model. They're learned with the objective functions that we'll talk about in the next class. Other questions? Yes? This? Yes, within the window. Yeah, yeah. Weights, the same weights are used for different windows. It's just that within the same window, the word students, the word open, the word there are all getting processed by essentially different 
weight matrices. I mean, you can just decompose this big matrix vector product into multiple smaller ones and see why that's happening. All right. Um, let's move on. I think this might be a short class, which is, which is good. <laughs> um, OK, so in a recurrent neural language model, uh, this is also kind of interesting because, um, OK, there's a note. I don't think h sub 0 is a learned perimeter. Uh, it can be. So there are many different implementations of these things that, uh, that allow for this to be a learned perimeter or not, um, depending on your, your framework. But OK, so here, let's say that we want to get the final um, distribution over the vocabulary as, as our output. So we apply a softmax layer over h sub 4, because h sub 4 here represents the students open there, that entire prefix, right? So if we apply the softmax layer over h sub 3, this would not be including the final word of this prefix. And so it wouldn't be um, exactly what we wanted to predict. So you can see that we can't compute h sub 4 without first computing h sub 3, without first computing h sub 2, and so on. So there's a sequence of computations that have to happen before I get to this point, which makes this kind of thing slow and motivates the um, transformer model that we'll discuss next week. Yeah. Uh, this is a question. If I only put uh, C1, C2, and C3 in, mm -hmm. can I get in there like the word C4? So at this ideally, at this point? Yeah, so like at uh, H3, am I ideally getting the there? Like the word there? What What do you mean I ideally getting the? Uh, no, basically, because the model is supposed to predict the next word. Yeah. Right? So are you saying if I put a softmax layer over H sub 3, Yes, I, and this is what happens in practice if you're training a recurrent neural language model. Uh, it would be a complete waste if, if I wanted to predict the word there after the students opened. Um, I did that in a completely separate computation, right? Because I could just put the softmax layer over h sub 3 and have the model predict there. Then I could update my hidden state using the ground truth next word there and then predict um, the next word books using the updated time step. So as we'll see in a bit, maybe uh, on Wednesday, the, uh, in a recurrent neural language model, you actually have a softmax layer over every single uh, hidden state in, the, um, in your input. So because you no longer have these fixed windows, right? You can just treat your training set as a contiguous sequence of text, and you can place a uh, a single softmax layer over every hidden state to predict the, the next word in the training set. So that gets rid of some of the uh, inefficiency. Yeah, go ahead. Is there like, a, like an efficiency peak if you talked about the model can't remember things that are very much in the past? Mm -hmm. right? So I'm wondering if there's like, a, oh, word one, word two, we have no clue what's going on in the model, and at word eight, we're peaking the probability of predicting the correct word. Yeah, so the, the question is, is there some point at which it becomes useless or inefficient to add more context, perhaps? Um, there is, but it's very dependent on the model size and the data set size. And um, I think I could give that answer to many questions that all of you can ask, because it really makes a huge difference. So the more parameters this model has and the more data it's trained on, the more it'll be able to essentially memorize patterns from the training set. And so the effective window size might increase um, quite a bit. Uh, and that, that window size, again, is uh, much higher when you have fancier versions of the, the memory mechanism here. Yeah. Uh, is it correct to say that h4 is then the embedding of the entire phrase? Yes. So h sub 4 is embedding of all of the words of this phrase that, that, are, uh, that we've been discussing. Yeah, the students open there. and so. If you wanted to use a recurrent neural network for a different task, let's say you wanted to use it for sentiment analysis, and you have this sentence, 
I mean, this is not a great, it's not even a sentence, but maybe you had the students open their books and you wanted to predict that this has neutral sentiment, like it doesn't have positive or negative sentiment. What you would do is encode the whole sentence in this fashion, and then at the final hidden state, the h sub five or whatever, you would put a softmax layer that had just three classes, positive, negative, neutral, and train it to predict the neutral label. So you can use recurrent neural, neural networks to embed sentences or documents or anything like that. Uh, different, oh, uh, so you mean like I could have three or two sets of completely different words, but adding them up could result in the same thing? That's true. Uh, that could also theoretically happen with the, with this model, um, but the it, it's much less. I I think it's unlikely in all cases if you have a big vocabulary and the training didn't get into some degenerate case. Um, there are, however, cases of um, so. For example, if I wanted to train this model uh, as an autoencoder to have it reconstruct its uh, representation of the sentence or something. There are cases where all the word embeddings could potentially go to zero and um, you would get a degenerate case. So you might see some of those kinds of problems in the practice midterms. Um, clearly I won't be putting them on the, the midterm in this class. But uh, yeah, did you have a question? Yeah. Does it make sense to like, uh, like yeah, so this is what we'll talk about when we discuss attention mechanisms next week. So right now, the softmax layer is directly placed over h sub 4. h sub 3, h sub 2, h sub 1, and h sub 0 are all contributing to h sub 4 through the recurrence. But as we'll see when we talk about backpropagation, that uh, connection can often be quite tenuous. Um, it may be very small. And so we might want to encourage the model to look back at any of these previous time steps if, if, for example, the students was much more important than everything that came between. You could imagine a case where there's some intermediate clause like, I don't know, the students who were evil, uh, the students, comma, who were, who were evil, comma, open there, where that clause is not really contributing to the uh, well, not contributing as much as knowing the subject of the sentence, right? And so maybe you would want more focus to go on H sub 2 and ignore all the in middle stuff. So attention mechanisms provide a way of letting the model look at different parts of the input. Yeah. Yeah. So the model will learn essentially where to look in the uh, sentence. And the, like, a look ahead to the rest of the semester. A transformer is basically like this kind of model, except there's no recurrence and there's only attention. So um, that'll make more sense once we talk about all of these concepts. But, yeah. So what happens if you put S0 and Softmax? Is it given the most common <laughs> Uh, I, generally, this is not, there's no training layer, classification layer placed on this H sub zero. I don't know what that would do. I mean, if it's a learned parameter, then it probably doesn't correspond to any word in the, uh, or prefix or anything like that. Um, if you want, you could try it. <laughs> I don't know what would happen. Did you have a question? Uh, it depends on how you're using this model. So if you're using it to um, like rank different sentences by their joint probability, then that doesn't matter. If you're using it to generate text, then that could matter, right? If, if say, for example, I'm generating text from this model. So we already saw how to generate text from an n-gram model. Um, how would I generate text from this recurrent neural model? So let's say I wanted to generate a word after seeing the students open there. What would I do? 
Yeah, exactly. So there are multiple ways, right? I could always take the max probable thing, in which case what you said might be an issue, like how do I break ties? Uh, it's very unlikely that you would have exact ties in this uh, distribution, but um, the other approach is just to sample from the distribution, right? So with x percent, I might take the word one that was in the tie, and with some other percent, I would take um, x sub two. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So um, the way in which these kinds of models have handled unknown words have changed over the last five, six years. Um, before, what you would do is you would take all words that are not in your training set, but maybe you encounter them in your test set. Um, actually, what you would do is you would take all words in the training set that occur with like less than x times where that's some threshold. So maybe all words that only occur once. And you would replace them with an unknown token. So the word, maybe students, is a very rare word. It only occurs once in your corpus. You would replace it with the onk open there, where onk is some unknown token. Um, then at test time, if you see a word that's not in your um, training set, you could just replace it with onk and um, continue. So and this is not a good way of handling these cases, right? Um, in uh, the, the current way that we do things, we don't actually use word level tokenization to break up the input. So if students didn't occur in our training set, maybe uh, student occurred and the S is a suffix that I could add as a separate token. So in a character level model, there are no unknown um, tokens, right? Everything is of one of a small subset of character, a uh, small set of characters. My vocabulary is very small, right? So um, nowadays we're gravitating more towards these cases where nothing really becomes an unknown word. If something is rare, it might get split up across a bunch of different tokens. Um, but uh, on average, we, we don't do this explicit pre-processing of our data to put in unknown words. Uh, the question is, are we embedding letters? In a character level model, yeah. So students would not be represented by one vector, but it would be represented with eight vectors, one for each character in the word. So you can see some issues with that, right? It makes things much more inefficient. You now have eight time steps to process the same word instead of one. But it has some um, positives as well. Yeah. No, the embeddings, just like in this case, are learned. They're parameters of the model that are learned through our training objective of predicting the next word. So um, we don't come up with these things beforehand. Actually, it's common to randomly initialize these um, word embeddings. And then through the process of predicting the next word, the model is kind of forced to learn reasonable embeddings for the, the words. Yeah, um, in general, like all these highly frequent function words cluster together. Um, so like the, the is a determiner. So uh, that's right, right? Those are, yeah. Okay, yeah, so the and, um, you know, and a, those, those words are all, um, if you do like some sort of 2D visualization. Well, we're not explicitly counting their frequency in these models, right? So this, the word the probably does not impact the prediction of uh, books here, right? Because it's, uh, I mean, students open their books is just as plausible as the students open their books. But there was a multiple of right, but remember that the model is learning what to do with each occurrence of a word, right? So if it decides that, oh, I saw this word the, it's not really helping uh, if I see all these other words. Um, then it could choose to not change the hidden representation all that much. So you see that, that there's a, a matrix multiplication here with W sub H 
from the previous time step. And then there's also this embedding uh, W sub E, which is kind of modulating how much of the current word gets injected into the, um, the previous time steps representation. So uh, conceivably, the model could decide, oh, this is a function word. It's not going to be important. I'm just not going to update my hidden representation that much after seeing it. But this is not uh, the same, right? The word embedding of the is very different than the word embedding of student. So the model will have to learn, um, you know, how to treat different words. And it's common not to just have one hidden layer, but have multiple um, layers in a recurrent neural network as well. So it's actually a very complicated function that the model can learn. Yes? Yeah, but, but it is captured by this uh, update equation that defines the recurrent neural network. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, so the question is why would we need something like attention if this recurrent neural model already captures everything about the previous uh, words that have been observed? The answer is that might all be well and good in theory, but in practice that's not happening at all. Um, also, attention was developed for machine translation models where you can clearly see why you might need this if you have a sentence in French and you want to create a sentence in English that's a translation. You already know that there are like kind of one-to-one -one mappings between a word in French and a word in English. I mean, not all the time, but um, sometimes, right? And so you might want the model not only to have just the final, uh, the hidden state that uh, contains the meaning of the entire French sentence, you might also want it to have access to the individual words so it can perform these one-to-one -one, um, translations. So that. It was originally developed for machine translation, but um, since then people have found it very useful for, for everything. So, so aren't we like introducing more parameters to the internet by performing better? Because then it can capture more. Uh, you, you can, so the question is, aren't we introducing more parameters when we add attention to a model? Is that why it's doing better than a model without attention? There are actually parameter-free versions of attention that you can include with just um, taking attention scores through dot products of these existing vectors and then including them through some sort of element-wise function. Uh, so it's not that the added parameters are affecting this. Um, it's actually a very useful way of improving the, the gradient flow in these models, which we'll talk about next time. OK, so I guess I'm just answering questions <laughs> for the rest of the class. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, sorry. So th maybe I should have just made this W something else. But this is the, uh, so W sub 2 here is projecting this four-dimensional hidden state vector into the uh, a vector that's of the size of the entire vocabulary, right? Because our vocabulary here contains potentially hundreds of thousands of things. So we need to do that projection before we can apply the softmax. How is W sub 2 calculated? Um, w sub 2 is a parameter of the model, so it's learned through this uh, process that we'll talk about next time. All right, maybe one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, it depends on the neighboring words, right? Because you see that part of the update equation is this H sub T minus 1. So even though this part of the, uh, the update might be the same, if you see the same word, this part is going to be different. And so the resulting hidden state is also going to be different. So it's really a function of the words that you've already seen in the past as well as this current word. 
Yeah. Uh, no, these C's will be the same, but the H's are not going to be the same. So that's how you get the context included in the, the function. Okay, so I'll take the remaining questions. Um, oh, actually, sorry, before I go, I ignored all the YouTube questions, so maybe I will do one of these. Uh, although it looks like Adam already answered one. Thank you, Adam. Um, an embedding of a word still relies on the previous hidden states for context. Uh, so I would say that the hidden state corresponding to the word, particular position of the word relies on all the previous words for context. The word embeddings are not contextualized, so they are the same regardless of wherever in the sequence they appear. So hopefully that um, answers that question. All right, so next time we will talk about backpropagation and remember to submit your final project teams.